Um, but this is the uh, this is the first of our close distances series, um, which is uh, each each month there's a different co-curator. So this month it's me and Mikayo. Um, next month um, it's me and Anna Gerton Walker, who I think is in the Zoom, which is nice. I like that. Good, you know, we're supporting. We're showing up for each other's things. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so uh, today, I guess, yeah, um, I know you're protecting your voice, but do you do you want to kick us off with a little bit of the of the intro for for today, Mikayo? I, I can totally do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes we sense a poet's energy before we even come into contact with their written work. All of these poets are like that for me, for me, in that way that the anchor of any poem is the poet themselves. For me, seeing the way these poets work and interact with their immediate worlds has become an invitation to push up through the dark. Their work is an energy I recognize, a resonance. And I've asked at least one of these poets what one needs to do to be able to resonate in that field. And it wasn't so much told or shown as it was that invitation of light to come up through the depths, to reach through a barrier, to stand firm in genuinity, honesty, and all the beauty we see and would like to see. It is a certain kind of magic that each of these poets wield. And I believe it is the magic of the world bending and world building kind. It is a certain kind of mentorship that even if we aren't in the same rooms or gardens, teaches us to duly expand above and below the soil. And just by being, this leads many others to expand and leaf and bloom in similar ways. I love that. That's so good. Um... I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, so, um, Tsuyan Juliet Lee writes, our terrain with one great periphery, it encircles all things. Bringing readers together creates a circuit among them, a circulation of energy and ideas. The terrain of the reading encircles them and us, their audience, uh, with an ephemeral perimeter. What's held in this space? What obtains here? It's a beautiful, terrible planet, mostly covered with water. Reading their chaplets, I started with Ella Long Pri, who stages for us the act of reading and takes us into its somatic, haptic dimensions. Long Pri holds Mei Mei Bersenbrugge's work in her hands. I feel Long Pri slow down, giving reading back to herself and to us in the process, illuminating an effective circuit that rhymes with Vicky Now's desire to be the kind of God uh, that gives God to God. I think of the tarot card temperance in which a figure is pouring water into water. Now's water that buries graveyards turns into piss, a stream of urethric light by which we read the present moment. Um, Juliet Lee drops us into the one that floods my heart. Her waters royal, our sea it drives violently upon retiring shores. And this makes another kind of room for those of us who struggle with feeling at ease, being simultaneous with bodies. Um, these are just a few notes that we were taking reading through um, the materials that these lovely poets sent in for their chaplets. Um, I think we're getting started today with Ella Longpre. Um, so I will just start with a bio. Um, Ella Longpre, she, they, is an author, How to Keep You Alive, 2017, and musician. Um, Elle's chapbooks have been published by Les Écrits uh, 9. I don't know what 9 is in French, but I'm imagining that it, yeah. Uh, the Loon, Ost, and Monkey Puzzle. And her recent work appears in La Vague, M Manifold Criticism, Jubilat, and Pulp Mouth. She is currently earning her PhD at the University of Denver and lives in Massachusetts. Um, as we discovered tonight, we live in the same town. 
uh five minutes before the reading we discovered this um and finally she can be found in the woods so um please give a warm round of digital applause for ella thank you so much zoe and thank you mike Ayo and zoe and belladonna for having us i'm really um so happy to read with these writers who i so admire um I'll just read um, from the beginning, the middle, and the end of a long manuscript that I'm working on right now. Um, and if you have any trouble hearing me, just shoot an emoticon uh, or emoji in the chat. Okay. It is well and good to memorize the static of the planets. I keep them on shuffle. Mercury likes to keep things simple. Venus is a gong in reverse, a shrinking echo tapers to a point. Something in its overwhelm is soothing, maybe because it's inescapable. It does all the work. You can subscribe to its channel. I prefer Jupiter. It's like a line of pipes my friend and I found once in a forest, a system of pipes actually from an old house that used to stand there. I'm not sure how the pipe stood without the house, Sometimes I wish I understood the mechanics of my environment better than I do, but the pipes did ring in the wind and it felt intentional. The moons is like that deep cistern where you can harmonize with your own echo. I've never been to either, but I've listened to both. I repeat the track of the moon. These planetary soundtracks aren't technically audio recordings, not like the wind we recorded on Mars. Each soundtrack is an emanation of the planet's electromagnetic field mapped as sound waves translated into audio. This imaginary mapping creates an imaginative space where other imaginations may take place. As I walk, I imagine deeply that the magnetic force of each planet is playing below my hearing all the time on another register all around in another sensory dimension altogether each planet playing a coded sound like a thumbprint, having its own density, distance, a pattern like a plot, a dance or storm. There must be planets whose electromagnetic vibrations map out into songs written on this planet. If I truly understand the nature of infinity correctly, then there is a planet out there for every song. I wonder which planet would emanate Judy Garland's live performance of Old Man River the one she did on her TV show in the 60s. In the video of this performance, there is one low angle, medium close up of her face during the bridge of the song near its end. She is almost in profile against the stage lights, but shot from below, like someone watching from the orchestra pit. As she sings, I'm tired of living, but scared of dying. For a moment, her face gestures and movements her struggles with fame and addiction, and the music all align like a solar system in study, a transitory moment of alignment. So that by the time she gets to the next line, belts out the final word of the song and runs a hand through her cropped hair, she's already moved out of vulnerability and back into execution performance. The electromagnetic vibrations of such a song It'd be the whole lifespan of a planet, the entire birth and death of its sun. Earth sounds like wind moving through an old house, a haunted song we've all heard before. On my walk, I stop because I am caught by the sound of a guitar amplified from behind a high window above. I backtrack till I'm at a gate, the trees creating a momentary archway, a passage, like I'm suddenly at a wooded abbey instead of walking a city sidewalk. The house behind the bushes is brick painted white some years ago. The gray arabesques are chipped and the shingles faded. There's stained glass on the second floor. Someone is playing quietly with a lamp on. From their window, they can't see the low angle of the sun behind the house. I want to take a picture, but it's better if I can't remember the exact colors of the window, if I can impose any song I choose. As I walk through the galleries, I think of the scene in Wings of Desire in which the angels go to the library. Their research materials are people who they read like audiobooks. 
They delight in listening to the internal monologue of each book and seem to have their own favorites, classic each angels return to. Although I wonder if all our thoughts would begin to sound the same to the angels after several millennia. The modernist individualism that's been trained into me insists that it can't be true. Our language, which is contextual and contingent on our frames of reference, would seem alien to another era of its speakers, like Wittgenstein's lion, who can speak but who we can't understand. The way we talk about love has changed, hasn't it? Our theories of mind, the degrees to which we imagine our own power, our place in the world, and how much we feel it asks of us. How the pace of our thoughts change according to our era, our activity, whether we are even present in our environments. If I were ageless, I wouldn't mind tracking these slow, irrevocable changes like the angels in this movie have done. Maybe Wim Wenders is saying that we are the angels, we the poets, studying the human and our cognition over time. But even for angels, studying is not enough. In this movie and its sequel, they both choose to plunge down to the street. Of course, the first angel to plunge is Bruno. He becomes dissatisfied with listening to the humans in black and white. He wants to try out experience. He has found his favorite classic, his masterwork, a trapeze artist with wild hair. So he lands on earth as a middle-aged man. This is the angel I identify with the most out of the three that we meet, or four if you count Willem Dafoe as the devil. Willem Dafoe does menacing best. Has the quality of our thoughts really changed so much? We still walk around thinking about love, worrying about others, planning and fantasizing about food. I would like to plunge into love with a beautiful dancer with wild hair and composure, to open a bakery together in color, to make bread each day and carry her child on my shoulders. There is a German show I'm watching about time travel. It's also about a boy losing his father and becoming a man in his shaggy bowl cut and simple raincoat, his independence and reliability. He's like a boy from another Wim Wenders movie, this LA boy who's just been reunited with his father only to, spoiler alert, lose him one last time. A redemption without reconciliation, without absolution, one of my favorite themes. These boys remind me of me in many ways, the boy I wanted to be as a child with my boy's name in my bowl cut and denim skirt at the reunion. The boy I carry with me still and bring out often, the boy I find in my friends who appears in dreams and who I often interpret to be someone else, but who is me. This boy in me comes alive when I watch these German or pseudo-German boys on their own road trips. Forgiveness is a journey through time. I am trying to find my own lost father, this German who I never met, who was gone before I was born, before I was adopted by my stepfather with the French name. The boy in me no needs to learn how to become a man. I'm reading a scientific article about causality, how we're learning that effect sometimes precedes cause, that present and future flip. I watch an episode called An Endless Cycle over and over. Sometimes I put the computer in front of my window, curtains open, so I can't really see everything that's happening on the screen. I think about how many times in one day I open the same tabs on the same screen and expect small changes. I also have trouble staying in the loop. The boy has an understated style. If you let yourself exist in a state of suspension, that is without looking, you will happen upon two separate causal chains traced out for you, effects with no known cause, two different timelines. But if you look before the end, things get spelled out for you. You don't see possibility, only one story. Time does its work in secret. Solving the catastrophe of your parentage by precluding your own birth. I try this, a thought experiment. Was I my own undoing? Across the courtyard, the snow on the roof is turning instantly to steam. I can see it swirl over to the balcony. 
It slides down the black shingles of the roof as if it's liquid water falls over the edge into a nothing. Not many domestic objects rotate anymore. The chair and the lamp let me know that the room has changed and now I'm sitting, the table is glowing, the wood grain is a golden pattern I illuminate with oil soap. My lamp is a drafting lamp. Walter Benjamin preferred the oil globe lamps of the 19th century, the glass halos with their hot inner atmospheres you control with a small brass switch like a key. In his essay, Lamp, Benjamin writes of his nostalgia for this type of lamp, particularly that it was portable. He says you could carry it through the entire apartment. My drafting lamp is mounted to my table by a vice, and when I do move it, not every time, but almost every time it clatters to the floor. When Benjamin's globe oil lamp moves through the dark apartment, its glass and metal make a clatter and its globe casts a ring behind it on the wall, a functional aureole. Gershom Sholem has recounted the conversations he and Benjamin had over the summer of 1918. Already at that time, Benjamin maintained the emergence of constellations as configurations on the surface of the sky. That was the beginning of reading. Just as cosmic bodies can be mapped as constellations, domestic objects can be configured as a grouping of symbols. By way of what he calls formative powers, which first compelled us to read the sky, then you mean reads domestic constellations like the cosmic ones. I open the grapefruit with a knife, but leave a little hinge so it's spread on the cutting board, symmetry apparent. A planet's electromagnetic field is like an opened grapefruit, wrinkles and all, oscillating unseen from its poles. These oscillations occur on the same wavelength as sound waves do. I'm listening to such recordings in my headphones again. They are a little lush to be called white noise. Returning to these sounds that I played for myself and my friends earlier this year, when we could still wander like planets in and out of public buildings at random, each time expecting small changes, still inhabit space together, still touch. Before the temporality of the virus surrounded the globe in its own inert ionosphere, the sounds to me then were like distant heterotopic dreams untouchable and unreal, though they documented real things. Now they have become more immediate and closer to me because they are something distant and fixed compared with a nearer shifting atmosphere. When looking for a faint and difficult object, avert your eye. I am on the planet. As I lift my arm, my elbow is cupped by its ring. In an MRI machine, you are told not to move. They even brace your head and neck. But if you lifted your hand, you could touch the strange circle around you as the magnetic fields capture images of your skull, the deep burning orbs of your eyes, really like suns after all. The sounds of some of the planets are like the sounds of this machine, especially Venus, tone deaf and abrasive, insisting itself again and again as the unseen camera slowly shifts around the ring, making noise patterns out of its movements. As the sounds shift in tone and pattern, the camera's magnetic resonance becomes more intimate, plunges a little deeper into you, seeing now past the bone, even into your thinking gray matter. Any lesions glowing, a flame against the gray, fleur de petite mal, a white dwarf cooling in space. In a time lapse of the universe, numbers become unfathomable. 5,000 years blooms into 5 million, 5 trillion, 5 million, million. Men in the park are talking about money in degrees which to me are unfathomable. 46 million might become 50 million if he hides his gold in a field. 100,000 people becomes 200,000 people. 37 trillion, trillion years from now, I imagine our sun will emit barely any light cooling its white heat into a dark surface. 
Our galaxy, like other galaxies, will have banished our sun, like the other cooling stars, into deep space. It will wander unmoored by any sisterly grasp. I wonder if we could then finally safely touch this degenerate and cold star, plunge our hand into its smooth pocked surface like slicing into a pool. If it fit in our palm, would it be viscous, leave sticky traces on our skin, or firm and cold like a lava stone, pumicing our calluses? It could be a small globe of our lover's hair wound from the brush, bits of fiber stuck in, tender and springy. There was a frost last night, and as my slippered foot tingles with cold, I think of the single strawberry in my friend's garden, frozen into softer red with seas of purple, biting into its icy crunch, a taste of winter first burning the tongue. Then in its core, a faint reminder of a taste something like summer, soft, wet, and fading. Thank you. Wow, that was lovely. Um, oh, one thing we didn't talk about before we let everyone in the Zoom. Do you want to trade off doing intros, Mikaya, or should I just go for it? I don't know where the intros are. <laughs> oh, uh, I'll just go for it. I'll just go for it. Yeah, I don't want to make you scramble. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, oh, uh, I like poetry readings. I know that it's cool to say they're not as fun on Zoom and maybe they're not as fun on Zoom, but, uh, but I like it. And I feel like the state that it puts us all in together, I think is a beautiful thing. Um, um, Okay, um, so our next uh, reader is uh, Suyun Juliet Lee, who lives in Denver, Colorado. Um, her books include Underground National. Uh, actually, wait, I think some of these books are by my computer, so I will hold them up. Uh, Underground National, Factory School Press, 2010, um, Solar Maximum, uh, Future Poem, 2015, um, No Comet. That serpent uh, in the sky means noise. Uh, Quarry Press, 2017. I don't know why, they, they just happen to be by computer. That's, I'll stop holding up books now. And uh, Aerial Concave Without Cloud, Night Boat, forthcoming. I don't have that because it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> um, but look out for it. Um, a former Pew Fellow in the Arts for Literature, she's held international residencies in video art and poetry and presented work at the Denver Art Museum, Artworks Center for Contemporary Art, Chicago's Citywide Performance Arts Festival in Time, and the Asian Arts Initiative. Her essays on race, contemporary poetics, trauma, and the avant-garde have appeared with Cambridge University Press, Iowa University Press, the Poetry Foundation, Entropy Magazine, um, and elsewhere. That my, that my tier was for Entropy. Um, Find her at silentbroadcast.com. Um, so take, take it away. Thank you, Zoe and Mika Ayo for curating. And Ella, that was just stunning. Um, I love hearing you read your work. Um, and I'm so grateful to have this space with you. And V, I'm so excited to get to participate with you and to hear you after this. Um, and I just wanna say thank you all to the friendly faces. I see a lot of folks sprinkled across the country who are just near and dear to my heart. Um, so that's just all for you. Um, so I'm going to start with um, something I've been working on um, erratically, um, and I'm calling it like ecological erotica. So with that said, here's um, my effort at it. So this is titled Condensation, Not a Linear Flame. With animal preparation, nest into moist birch curls, rich with secretive lavender teeth. Powder pale fragrance dusts the bridge of my nose when I raise my head to catch a thick breath. Push deeper, 
dark roots lit with quicksilver heave beneath your murmuring mouth for hours. Tear and tie the rough linens of whose sinews with a syncopated intensity, muscles swollen to gleam. And of what honest gravity? Lamp lit, then drawn down. Likewise, pull magenta spurts into quick succession until they recede. Observe onyx marbles as they roll sideways over rough planks. Meditate on ancestral pathways like migratory swarms through the sky. Your tongue flickers in a mind with slow condensation, not a linear flame. And my spine takes on the horizon. Curve resplendently over black red coals, rolling them methodically over and over and over again into delirious dissipation, into the finest dark dust. Drag citrine through them to hold in your mouth for days. At dusk, we see how the fuchsia rose gleam of gone catches in ice's stiff columns clinging gently from the trees. Seek out the endless turns of water's mutability, how it miraculously captures the day's quiet speech. My mouth glides over its slick script, noting mineral composites as I slid down the smooth walls of my throat. Churn. Kneel and lap the slow bitumen seeping out from between my legs. Taste the hesitating starlight before its final jet of black flame. Also, this is my first time doing a reading where I'm having to wear headphones and I can like hear my own skull happening <laughs> like as I'm reading. So I'm having a really intense experience with this with you all tonight. And I have to wear these just because I, my nephew's upstairs like running around and the ambient noise actually in the space is a little loud. So um, just want to share that. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to read this poem called The Scar. I wrote it several years ago when I was in um, Bremerton, Washington, which is sort of like a distant outreach suburb of Seattle. And I was like on a walk um, at this uh, arts residency space and um, kind of found myself on this like off path through the woods. And it actually turned into um, a space of clear cut, which I realized was being um, opened for further gentrification of the landscape. Um, this was the kind of place where, that were like second homes, vacation homes, primarily for like owning class people in the city. And um, it just really affected me, I think, because of the headspace I was in during the walk. And um, uh, this, this emerged from that. So um, the scar, and it opens with just like a series of definitions for what um, I have, I found for scar um, and then moves into the poem itself. <clears throat> so the scar, a dark mark left on the skin or within body tissue where a burn or sore has not healed completely and fibrous connective tissue has developed. A lasting effect of grief, fear or other emotion left on a person's character by an unpleasant experience. A mark left on something following damage of, of some kind a mark left at the point of separation of a leaf, a frond, or other part from a plant, and a steep high cliff or rock outcrop, especially of limestone. So the scar. <clears throat> the scar. In the end, feral children discover our bodies, now bleached into silver. Ash slides, feathers ardently into the proximate darkness. A vertical imagination dominates this landscape. I'm not immune to its patterns. The scar. At the beginning, dandelion and tall reeds, dry spring grasses. After so many hours, time elongates. After so many hours, never a dissipation in memory. At the beginning, a clutch of frail pink blossoms, small bursts of spun breath in my hand a drone shudders overhead. 
Were we so unremarkable, finally alone in that last dappled light? The scar? With nameless curiosity, he reached out a hand. Trace a golden perimeter in bird song, make fragrant the single sky. The scar, green then silvered accents along the forest floor, soft with lost seeds, rot. Mushrooms crowd together for survival. We tend to see an enterprising colony, not a clutch of individuals begging to live. The scar, recollect the electrical discharge, erotic intensity housed in the limp. Were we monumental along the pale horizon at noon? Now, walk without mirrors. Now, be loud in your own noise. The scar, world and world again, blankly. Nodules of inattention uprooted into the light, a white desiccation whose glory the scar, a churned space for survival, walk across it ignorantly, such pleasure, and tall reeds, their swarms, the marks that remain on the body, the slightest pale light, a gleam, narrow face of a doe in blonde grasses, dry seed heads plink to the ground, sod and sod and sod, tremulous and pale relief, silver gray tones at night, vibrant with the hush of breath, skimming, Action of my fingers against the solitary star reflected in the lake, its dark wash, not so bright in the frail neon effervescence of the last sky, a final nocturne. Why such indifference? Um, I'm gonna share from uh, my next book, which is coming out with um, Nightboat, which I'm so excited about. Um, shameless plug, I hope everyone buys it when it comes out. <laughs> um, but it's called Ariel Concave Without Cloud. And um, I'm responding to like Georgic poetry. It's um, it's ecological in nature. And um, a lot of it is an investigation, of course, and a conversation with light, um, which is something I've been writing about for many years. And um, so I was like, music, Newton makes an appearance a bunch of Georgic poetry from like the 1800s makes an appearance. I make many appearances, um, but I wanted to share this um, piece from it, which is called The Incident. And I did a lot of research into like solar physics while I was composing this and um, solar maximum also at the time. But um, an incident is actually like when light strikes the surface and how it reflects off of that surface, how it responds. So um, like an incident light is like, I guess a term for it. But I also was struck by that word incident because I hear it used a lot in like referencing like criminal activity when something bad happened to someone or a harm, it's called like the incident. So there's a little play on that. Um, okay. I'm gonna take a little drink of water. This is not water, this is a glass of wine. My brother pop. All right, it's the incident. <clears throat> a narrow band to which one is sensitive, beyond which lies the invisible. Some is inevitably lost. How so? To fall is a great incident. To fall slowly without injury as to become a magnitude in reckoning. All things fall gracefully. Are you grateful for what has fallen into you? Standard, average, common, all integrated in the single reading. To make a record, one must capture what is reflected evaluating what one wants to be represented. In counterclockwise rotation, arms outstretched, feel the sun's hard blue descent into the black coal of your breathing body. Gather without reflection, gather infinitely, growing fine as a needle spray along the skin. 
surmise the quality of infinite duration, flexing intimate storms into apparel, all dark scintillation honed. I sought to uncover my primary mother's body firstly by standing alone on the basalt shore, all gleams with a crystalline equanimity. Stark blue light coursed upwards with suspension as a slow heat dissolved into my pores, flexing the long stones inside my legs as mass. I moved with a deliberate, calculated pace towards the shore. That which travels from one place to another, interacting with matter, can be transformed. It would be incomplete or the law would fail if the transfers and transformations were not accounted for. No exact correspondences, an approximation. To form a descriptive system appropriate with minor modifications to a wide range of observations in sound and light, as well as to waves, can a body be indifferent to the incident, to all common properties that disturb? By its use, certain important results are obtained in a simple way. I would like to speak simply, you. Bleached convoy, my words flutter on no flag. Without fire, they relinquish their misses reflectively casting a negative and old fury now quelled into a neutral desire to simply see, to recover what conjured forth a name. Some is inevitably lost. Bow slowly and rise, transforming the crown of the head into a vertical suspiration. Strive to announce a perfectly quiet reception in the limbs now steadfastly affirmed by their polar coordination. Find purchase in the dark curling swarm that were once toes. If the disturbance has a scalar quantity, if the disturbance produces a similar disturbance at a neighboring point at a slightly later time, if the disturbance is continuously transformed from one place to another, what is neglected in the present discussion? Strive to determine the initial conditions. Flower into what must hold. And to close, um, I thought I'd share a little bit from uh, something different. Um, this is actually from my very first chaplet that Belladonna put out like maybe seven years ago um, and it's called Juliet and the Boys. And I really love this little thing. Um, it's not like poetry I typically um, have shared with the world. Um, and it's kind of like a lot of my misadventures dating. <laughs> so this will just be a little bonbon of, I don't know what like for you all before we move to these sharing. Um, but you'll just hear like uh, initials instead of names. And I, I really enjoy these. So I'll read a couple of these to close. Um, <laughs> I just thought I got you laughing. Okay. Julian and the boys. C writes, tells me he's been watching those videos of me. Am I around in October covered in honey? There are all kinds of ways to get lost in a beautiful black cornfield bent over backwards and hair. Am I thinking about the Perseids when I shower? the next one in knee socks or the news, whichever. Am I thinking of it too? G calls the Dutchman arrived. He's had a hundred swords hanging over him, $40,000. File 17th century paper clips, keeps a stoned mannequin upright in the basement. Thinks about me at lunch in the morning too, at night with trains outside. Will I on the phone with his mom all breathless next time? It hurts. It rings on Friday, yes, yes. K messages, 
there's Japan and a steel bike or a Bible somewhere near the panhandle and a stab and run, was it okay, am I? P texts, writes, calls, calls again, apologizes, quits. S asks if there are gorgeous fruit left in the trees, how I snuck back so quietly. Q texts the entrance to the park at night, some beers. Why am I so beautiful in poems? Dusk light shows everything nicely, not noon. Takes eight seconds to have a thought, doodles with depth, wants to chase. X tells me she's crazy, laughs how lucky they are. Another ship crossing, no bridges, just suffering for their rise, beauty, love, his pain. R asks, can he slap it with a belt, shirt off, and horse? I look like just like his mother. B sends a panda. The end. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Zoe and Mikayo, for the beautiful introductions. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, and to end with a bonbon. Truly a delight. Um, so now to move into our final reader of the night. Um, oh, this is great. What a, what a nice night. Um, we could just be doing nothing Tuesday and instead we're doing this. It feels like a real pinnacle of human achievement to me. Uh, okay, so Vicky now uh, is the author of six poetry collections, um, Fish Carcass, Black Sun Lit, 2022. Uh, so look out for that, right? That doesn't exist yet. Uh, no, not yet. Um, a Bell Curve is a Pregnant Straight Line, 1111 Press, 2021. Human Tetris, uh, 1111 Press 2019, Sheep Machine, Black Sunlit 2018, Umbilical Hospital, uh, Press 1913, 2017, The Old Philosopher, uh, winner of the Night Boat Prize for 2014. Oh, hey, you're going to be press, press mates. Um, is that what it's called? <laughs> um, uh, where was I? And of the short story collection, A Brief Alphabet of Torture, uh, winner of the 2016 FC2's uh, Ronald Sukunik Innovative Fiction Prize and the novel Fish in Exile, uh, Coffee House Press 2016. Um, her work includes poetry, fiction, film, and cross-genre collaboration. Um, she was the fall 2019 fellow at the Black Mountain Institute, um, which in my mind, I'm imagining like that you were time traveling and hanging out with John Cage and um, you know, Ruth the Sawa and whoever else was there. <laughs> but that's, I know that time travel is not possible. Uh, and is it? I don't know. Um, you can find out more uh, at vknow.com. Um, so please uh, e, e applaud for our final reader of the night. Thank you, Zoe, for the warm introduction. Um, and thank you, Mikaayo, for being here despite not feeling too well uh, throat-wise and otherwise. Um, been wonderful to be here with um, Ella and Juliet. Um, and thank you everyone for um, attending this reading on this Tuesday evening. I'm going to read a few poems that my uh, students assigned me, uh, or I actually assigned a class and I happen to, oftentimes they generate prompts and to, test drive some of their prompts, I actually do their assignments that they assign the classroom just to see how, how well that prompt um, stand in the classroom structure. And so these, I'll read two poems from, from their assignment and then I'll read um, 
a poem from um, a bell curve is a print in a straight line. My most recent poetry collection. I don't know why I chose some of these poems to read because they're, so, they're difficult to pronounce. So I'm sorry if I'm butchering up the English language. Um, drifting. There's this incomprehensible sadness that arrives to me. Havocked of perdition, seclusion in sedition, montage of yearning. I've been your neo-sulfate in my aftertaste that sadness reaches into my broken ribs. Two nights ago, I've been crushed by a cow. Sorrow is my tomorrow. I keep on repeating, pulling the drawer of reef, socks flooding my internal cemetery. You are born, reborn again. In my mind, silent earlobes, earrings chanting in the hidden wind of your hypocampus, meadow and pearls, by vacuuming, biovacking near your fading gray curls. Tofu has curded, you are cured. Bacon roasting silently in the oven. While I kiss the olive bread of its oval Mediterranean martini. You take a clover of poise, a leafless of fear. You take me into your bovine blouse aroused by the wind silent infant and flog each dream out of my body. Liquid reference length of formula. What did I know of Barcelona's informality with Catalonia's catacomb? What did you want me to know when autumn forgets to sleep on your hay implanted breasts? What do I know of your pastoral hallucination after a long seclusion in your last night's nightmares? Apparatus. Not wishing to end my life in a well. I have measured my anexalabatic appetite with an inflection laced in avocado bats feather. And quiet, so quiet, the nascent ambush ambulates around my eye duct. Quack for the ophthalmological canal. Shafts moving one pipeline in body in audio. I face my invisibility by fluttering my heart. The music above the Empyrean sky. Its lower chamber without trachea, without inlet, without you dress for my indecipherable ambush. I fall from your fingertip one piano chord, each hammer depressed, each soundboard three pedals away from that rashed. A flower polished by your voice climbing out of a shaft. Oil, water, gas. My suicide is ambient light for those who rides the nocturnal sky with a knife wetted for politics, for self, for resistance. So um, the room in five moves of cannot. From my collection about characters of written straight line. The room in five moods of cannot. The room cannot feel its arteries stuffed with animal fat from the insulation, 
cannot hope to alter its mouth and eating is not a thing that it can do well. The room hasn't taken a bath since 1987, but there was a slight wash in 1992 that bestowed in a room its perforated body. The room cannot control the content of its character, cannot control its happiness as a regular visitor of the closet. What can it control? The room can sit naked for a really long time until someone moves in. Sometimes at night, the room falls in love with the refrigerator near the sink. Cannot help but stare at the light in a carton of eggs and the mini skirt of green onions and underpants of cilantro floating on the clothes hanger of the cylindric stem. The room doesn't want to be redundant, but how can it write a love letter to something that cannot even cross its legs? Thank you for listening and thank you for all my friends and strangers who've come to this reading. Um, I recognize all of you, but um, I don't know how to say hello individually to all of you. So this is my way of saying hello to you individually through universal methods. Thank you, Bella Donna, for having us. Well, that was amazing. <laughs> um, I love how many fans we've gathered of 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 butchery. <laughs> um. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much for reading. Uh, thanks, thanks to all of our readers. Thank you to my co-host. Uh, thanks to the Belladonna crew. Thanks to everyone who came. Um, I feel like I should plug the chaplets. There are three beautiful chaplets, one for each of these amazing readers um, that you can pick up uh, at belladonna.com slash chaplet, I think. Um, so, so definitely, I strongly encourage you to do that and to check out their other books and to follow their deals and become obsessed with them, but in a healthy way, not, not too obsessed, just normal, parasocial. Um, and we will see you again uh, next month. Um, if you're subscribed to the Belladonna newsletter or if you follow us on social media, um, you will be hearing... Um, a lot about that next one as as it unfolds um so thank thanks again everyone and um have have such a lovely night thank you all